Well, you know, you see Chippendale dancers, or me, when I used to do dancing, you, you gotta, they'll pull it a couple times and stretch it. You pull it and stretch it, then let go. All Chippendale dancers do that. They don't just go to a stage and pull their pants down. It'll be a noodle. It'll be like, what the fuck is this? Oh, you're a dancer? You're gonna be kidding me, you know? <laughs> okay, Rob. Uh, where, uh, where are you from originally? Where did you grow up? I'm originally from New York, uh, Bayside, Queens, New York, where I got my degree. I got my bachelor's in education, bachelor's in theater. I taught theater at the uh, Venture Theater School in New Brunswick, New Jersey. And then I went and got my master's in special ed where I was teaching mentally handicapped. I did it so many years ago, they didn't call it autism. They called it childhood schizophrenia. Yeah. Shows you how back in ancient times. I just started teaching in 1977. Or no, 70, 76, 77. Do you grew up with both your parents? Yes, my mom, uh, I was born and raised by mom and dad. She, she developed Parkinson's disease. So she was a bit hard to, you know, to work with, to deal with. It was tough. Yeah. I mean, we all loved it and we'd do our thing, you know. Parkinson's doesn't really shorten your life. It just makes it not a great life, you know. So we all, you know, we, we still got along as a family. My dad held it together. He's around today. He drives a car. He's 103 years old. Wow. My dad lives in Atlanta, uh, Nashville, Tennessee. My brother is a heads up, a big, huge corporation. He uh, works for them and he went to Harvard. I have a cousin, uh, my female cousin, who I helped to get her first job as a waitress up in the Catskill Mountains. A lot of Jews went up there for fresh air, you know. And so she works for the government. Very high ranking. We're all very proud. She went to Stanford. So I got right, my mom was a spy during World War II. Cause she was, you know, behind enemy lines a couple of times. So uh, my dad built, um, towers in the Philippines to try to, you know, keep it pro-American, not so Japanese, you know. Very interesting so. family, yeah. Oh, it's a great family, very great, very hardworking, intelligent, proud to call myself a Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> then, That's really my name. How did you end up getting into porn? Uh, the job market was so hard and difficult for, you know, to get work, because everybody wants to do it in New York, Los Angeles, Florida, Chicago. People, you know, they're driving a taxi and the first thing you say is, well, I'm driving a cab, however, I'm actually um, you know, an actor. I'm actually a writer. I'm actually a songwriter. You know, I wrote that. You know, everyone, you know, wants to be a performer. So that it was a horribly difficult job market. So I kind of settled, you know, uh, met a guy named Joe Sarno, who was directing regular, you know, movies. We hung out, we chatted, and he goes, listen, I got some Weird news for you. I saw the, the pictures I did in Playgirl magazine, which I did. John Ritter was on the cover, which I'll tell you later on how coincidental that is. But John, he wasn't nude or anything, but he was skimpy, you know, in bathing suit. But Three's company was hot. So John Ritter, um, he was in the cover. I was inside the magazine. And uh, years later, me and John both suffered, you know, heart problems, you know. Uh, the aortic, you know, heart problems, vascular heart problems. And we both had our, uh, an aortic dissection at the same time. Him at Kaiser, me at Cedar sinai he passed away. He didn't make it. I did, you know, and I'm here to talk about it. So I'm one of the very few people who actually have survived, you know, aortic dissection. And in fact, um, CNN called me a badass for driving myself to the hospital. <laughs> I'm driving myself to the hospital. So anyway, so, um, so how I got it? So I was doing theater. Went to Joe. Joe said I'll put you in a movie, but my films are no longer R-rated. I'm shooting porn, and he was actually almost a legendary director. You know, from, he went to Sweden. He used to shoot. He was very well known, very well respected. I said to Joe, maybe I'll do it then. He goes, well, if you can do it. I asked my friends and family what they thought, and at that time I was doing, I was teaching mentally challenged kids. I was doing theater, or theater, uh -huh, in New York. And then I got this option to make some money because you make dick when you're trying to be an actor. And so I, I gave it a shot, asked my family what they think. And I said, you know, it is kind of sleazy doing porn. But then again, I'm sleazy, maybe it's a perfect match. So I went and did it. 
I was able to do it. People saw that I had a ab larger than average schmeckle. So I took out the schmeckle right out of the pants, balls deep, you know, and there you have your what first year, lesson. What year was that? That was 1978. 1977 we shot it, 1978 they were adding more scenes, and then all of a sudden me and John Ritter had our problem. Isn't that crazy? And then years later, you know, uh, John had a bigger problem and died. Amy Yazbak, his wife, actress, sued, you know, because uh, there were mistakes made supposedly. He was, not, he was being held under observation. My doctors at UCLA and at Cedar sinai said, there's no observation for you, Ron. We want to bring you right into operation right now. You're lucky you're alive. How long is the operation? Ten hours. Oh, oh, oh. And uh, how long am I going to be recuperating? A month. I had plans tomorrow. Not anymore. I had a wedding. Not anymore. There you have it. Cute little Indian guy. Kept me alive. Everyone said he saved my life. He wouldn't let me go, which I love the guy for it. I, I needed a second operation. I was bleeding internally. Some doctors will go iffy on that because are you going to survive or not? He was not going to let me go. You know, this guy is gold. Others have seen him since and I've referred him. Amir Shaw. Am I a cardiologist? Um, Ernst Schwartz. You know, so those are the two guys. So that was 78. Certainly the porn industry has changed a lot in all these years since, right? The business has changed like you wouldn't believe. I mean, I thought it was changing a lot when it went from film to video, to VHS, to, to Betamax, to internet, to interactive interactivity, to um, virtual reality, you know, to ridiculous dialogue. Hi, where are you from? Okay, who ordered the large sausage? How come you don't have the money to pay for it? To other scenes where um, amateur, you know, like, you know, what you're going to do when they come for you? You know, you figure you look out the window of your, of your home and go, hey, look, looks like the same cops we just saw on television. Some bitch. That is the same cops. You know, so uh, uh, it became more like uh, goofy, you know, like just those crazy dialogue scenes. Then it got classy. Films like uh, Cafe Flesh, um, Roommates, um, Chuck Vincent, Anthony Spinelli, uh, some famous directors like uh, Wes Craven, who did Nightmare on Elm, Elm Street, you know, Abelson, John Abelson, I think, did some either softcore or hardcore. It was becoming almost, almost publicly acceptable to do this because it just was acceptable. They even made a satire. Um, the judge wouldn't allow, they, they prosecuted some of these porn films. And the judge, you know, in New York tried to let some of it go and try to to remind people this is freedom of speech, these are performers. And it was a very touch and go situation. They eventually beat it, I think, Harry Reams, Linda Lovelace, you know. And uh, there you have it. Porn was kind of born. And then it went to, like I said, um, more highly advanced um, science. They started going to interactivity, and now, like I said, um, uh, virtual reality and now and in the internet now a, a large part of the business is um cam girls they'll walk around with a computer hi bob look is this girl pretty this is me we hope you win the award tonight you know and that's a, a large part of the business now it's the cam girls are a large part of the biz and before they were not and the public seems to like it got male talent does not like it you know guys in the porn because not a lot of work for them anymore. Now it's just you and the consumer. Right. Hi, Bob. Should I pull down my panties? You know? Yeah. yeah, please. You know? How's that for a nasty voice? Yes, pull them all the way down. Good. Now come over here and sit right on my face. You, uh, the industry's been good to you. You obviously became uh, like one of the most famous porn actors ever, right? Nobody argues that. Uh, it's worldwide. Yeah. When I went to Europe and I was shooting films in Italy, Rimini, Riccioni, um, Firenze, Florence, uh, and uh, Roma with Rocco, Cicciolina, and all these people. Yeah, I worked all internationally. Yeah. And I did great with it. 
Mario Soleri, Mario Altieri, uh, Mario Polak, Ricardo Schicchi. Cicciolini became the only, or the first, we'll see what happens now, uh, diplomat to actually attain office as a porn star. You know, Cicciolini was uh, a Hungarian, Alona Stoller is her real name. And she talked like this, hello to Angie to me. And so we did a couple scenes together. And I admired the fact that in Italy, the parliament voted in a porn star. And she has that title for life. Not the one porn star, the being a diplomat. I thought that was too cool. And then woke up the next morning, joking! It was a joke, they're kidding. Hey, uh, Giuseppe, see what's on the radio. Uh, some porn stars just got into the parliament. They, I voted for her. So did everybody else. What the fuck? Well, I'll be, you know, and that's kind of, she became the only, and then she got not allowed to come into America. I said, I never discussed this before. It's interesting. Because she was trying to make a deal with terrorists, and America doesn't do that. She made out an initial, she gave a big speech where she said that if um, Saddam Hussein, when he had those captive Americans, because if he let them go, if, she'll, if Saddam Hussein will let the girls go, and guys, she'll have sex with him. American government took it a little too serious and banned her from ever coming into America. So she came in through Canada because she had a child, she had a son, and she had a custody battle. Jeff Koons, very famous uh, uh, artist out of New York, so he, you know, won his, you know, uh, he won the right to have custody. She won the right to have custody. Somebody's got to give up something. What personality traits do you think you have or, or, or a porn actor needs to, to survive and make it and thrive? Finding the humor in, in anything and everything. Nothing can't be too funny or unfunny, you know? It's uh, allowing yourself just to make a fool of yourself and then shine right afterwards. Were you married? Do you have kids? No. No, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind. I, I love kids. And I used to be a school teacher. And I, I, I would be a great dad, but not a great husband. I'd be into probably that swinging lifestyle, you know. Yeah, but there are some people that are into that. A lot of them are, especially in our business. Yeah. Are you? Have you had a girl in... No, that's, I'm, I'm probably <laughs> as straight as narrow, but... But I, I totally accept and respect people's choices to do all sure. that fun stuff. You know, it's not, it's not, it's just not my thing. But, sure. but like you know, the porn actors I've talked to have all said, most of them have said, you kind of need to stick with somebody in the industry in order to have a successful relationship. Was it a guy or girl? Uh, both. Well, I, I wouldn't say that's totally true, because you heard the expression, opposites can attract. Yeah. You know, so in a way, it certainly does give you an added boost. I think, you know. There's always, but to, there's always exceptions every rule. Yeah, but every be all and, uh, you know, um, it makes it, you have a more of an understanding. You don't, you don't sweat the small stuff. You know, like, you, you accept the fact that maybe we're here to be emotionally monogamous, travel together, hold hands, look at scenery, go to the Grand Canyon, yeah. and physically non-monogamous, you know, because it's easier to do that. It's very hard. It's hard for a lot of people to separate. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, and I've been, I had my name on a swing club. It was called Ron Jeremy's Club Sesso in Portland, Oregon. It did good, did real good. And I saw how people were, and it was really a good lesson. That, you know, if you can get past this, the, um, the jealousy, you can have a good time. You know, and it doesn't, doesn't mean you have to play hide the bacon and shoot the sherbet, drain the main vein, and Squeeze the weasel. You don't have to do that. You can just simply be with your, your own wife, your own husband, and watch other people. And that's a turn on. Want to get a little experimental? Yeah, there you go. If you can get into that lifestyle, it could be a lot of fun. You know, you could, um, you know, and do it with, and share it with the person you care about. And you don't, you don't let it get too far. You're just having a little physical fun. Then go back together again for another few months, a few years, whatever. You feel the itch to be with some other flesh doesn't detract from the romance. People are always afraid of that. It's not. And if you are afraid of that, do something where it's too far to get to. Like uh, Maui, Hawaii, or Key West, Florida. If you do things down there, 
you know, we got as much to worry about because it's too big a deal to go to those exotic locations. So you and your wife or you and your girlfriend or whatever can just enjoy a nice romance. What, what, what is it about the act of sex that, that pushes people's buttons? So many people get worked up over it, whether it's... Meaning in a bad way. Yeah, and it's like shame or there's violence connected with it sometimes and there's, there's all kinds of weird... It's, it's a shame because you shouldn't get worked up all over it. It's a fun thing. I mean, I like that Hustler had a very nice slogan. It was called, relax, it's just sex. I like that, you know? Uh, I think you're right. Yeah, and it's true. It's making too big a deal about it. Just have fun. You want to do something, do it. You don't, don't. And what's funny too is that they said, um, you know, you, you can get hurt, you know, God knows what. And uh, Bill Margold had a great expression. He said, you're not going to get hurt watching porn Nobody ever died watching porn unless they got too close to the VCR and got electrocuted. Otherwise, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's true. I mean, they, 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 when I debate the Triple X Church, kind of Chris Gro uh, Craig Gross, we've been all over the world debating. And I've made it a point to say that, you know, which has done more to kill people, religion or adult movies? You know? What, uh, Everything we do here is good. Yeah. What, what, uh, like you must get recognized when you're out in public, right? Yes. And do you have, do you have like fans that come up to you? What kind of, what kind of yes. reaction do you get out in public? Hey, dude, what's so and so like? Does Christy Canyon really got national boobies? Or hey, do you guys got to take those tests? Do you got to do that? Did you have to do gay films before you did straight films? And those are some other ones. Do your parents know what you're doing? Your sister know what you're doing? Your cousin, your best friends, and girlfriend. Women, uh, they know the, what you're doing. Do women fall into your lap because you're on Jeremy? Say what? Do women fall into your lap because you're on Jeremy? Well, I certainly wish they would more often, but yes, I get them some of that once in a while. How many women have you had sex with? Let's see. Whenever guys ask me that, I have a very funny answer. I always say, uh, including your mom, I had one, two, three, but, uh, but around 3,600. When me and, uh, I do a joke about it in my comedy act, when me and Gene Simmons were asked that question uh, by Barbara Walters on two separate occasions, I, you know, I said, look, this is Gene Simmons. He gets girls that look like his Playboy playmate, Shannon Tweed, who he married. Me, when I'm not working, I get girls that look like Gene Simmons. <laughs> that's funny. That's not a rehearsed joke, of course not. What's, what's the most but that's a, fair, that's a fair answer, really. About 30, about 336, 3,600 women. What, what, what's the most misunderstood thing about the porn industry? Uh, the industry or me? Either one. Or both. Uh, both. Uh, for me, people think that we're combing the schoolyards looking for girls. Hey, want to get in the business? Come on. Not like that at all. Now it's the girl cam girls, the girls who are, you know, working, you know, and, and uh, some as escorts. Some uh, at uh, topless clubs and nude clubs, you know. So it's like, and they all volunteer. They get the ads in the paper, and then the LA Direct models are it's Mark Spiegler or Jim South. These guys get the phone calls for the work, and then the girl comes in, does an interview like anything else. You know, they the people who really hate the industry think that it doesn't want to do that. That you know, that the, the person's like soliciting you. They're not. There are a lot of girls who want to do this. And now on the cam girls, where it's just you and the consumer, you know, the guy and the, it's a whole different ballgame. Yeah. It really is just the girl and the fan. So that's why a lot of adult film actors are not working anymore. A lot of my friends are not doing porn anymore because it isn't the work. Yeah. There was a woman, I think North Carolina, who got fired because she was discovered as a porn star. Look, it's gonna happen. If you're gonna, you know, think of a career of being a school teacher, don't do adult films today, you know? So that's happened where then, have there, has there been discrimination? Sure, sure. You know, there are, there are women who've had raw deal. Um, men, not as often, but women, yes. What, uh, what are the downsides of, of porn, a career of porn? What, what, what kind of negatives have you seen? Well, what I just said that was positive and good, and it feels good and it's fun to do, is in the same logic, works against you as well, you know, because if you're a porn star and your wife really believes or girlfriend believes that for love or money, that's it. You're going to play around for love or money. If it's a brothel, 
and I'm going to mess around with a guy or something you know, it's going to, I'm helping earn the breadwinning, then, I, then I'm going to earn us, earn us a living, you know, and you can kick in and work at the gas station where you were before, and this way we'll all have fun, you know. And so sometimes, you know, that which makes porn fun and you're tough enough to take it because your wife or girlfriend loves you, they're just going to watch some other couple, you know. So uh, the good is it works. I've seen it work really well. The bad is it might not work, you know. Hey, dude, that, that's my girl. You're at a swing club. Put a sun on your forehead, you know. What's, so, what's the longest uh, romantic relationship you've, you've had in your life? Nine and three-quarter inches. Ah, I love that one. The, the longest. Margie, Alice, Tanya. Wait, Margie, four years. Alice, four years. I was in high school at the time. Uh, Alice, four years. Tanya, I was already in college and then going into porn. That was like two years. It was four years, four years, two years. And then... Uh, Venice and I were more like friends from the very beginning, Venice. And then Natalie, friend for 15 years, best friends. She has a bunch of adorable children and I'm Uncle Ron. Whenever I show up, you know, the car pulls up to where they're living in, yeah. in the south and the girls will come running out of the house. Uncle Ron, Uncle Ron. How do you beat that? Yeah. I think, I think it's the kind of things I like people wouldn't expect I like. You, you must have some incredibly interesting stories from your illustrious career, right? T share, share a story or two of something fun in the part I'm on the, I'm in Mallorca, uh, Spain. And we had done some stuff in Spain, and now I'm shooting in Mallorca on the ocean. Uh, I took bonine pills, which John Leslie told me to take, and it was a really all-star cast. Nacho Vidal from Spain, Rocco from Italy, Cicciolina, Moana Pozzi. A lot of the big European stars were on a boat. Everybody threw up. I did not, because John Leslie saved me, you know, with these pills that really work. And then, but the girl would be bent over the edge of the boat, and rather than blowing me, she's blowing chunks. And so then uh, I told the director, we were going to do this, and Mario Soleri, uh, with a girl named Selene, beautiful girl, goes, look, these girls are going to have sex with you, Ron. We need to get the shots. They're throwing up. We can all deal with it. Girls, it's okay. <laughs> so... I did a sex scene with two girls, and while they were shooting, they shot the action. They shot the hardcore, you know, right there. Uncircumcised dicks a lot of the time, boys. And they panned up and down this far, and you'd see hardcore action, right? And then when they got to shore, the nice thing about seasickness is it goes away once you're in, uh, at the shore. So we get to the shore, everyone felt great. I was the only one who did not get ill anyway. The cameraman got sick, makeup artist got sick, the chef got sick. And I never did. And so then now they shot me and the girl with their faces against the sky and going the same dialogue. Oh, baby. Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, uh. And so uh, that was a cum shot. And here's, here's sperm in the throat. Thank you. Wait, so then, uh, um, so when we got back to shore, we shot the footage we needed and just didn't show the action because during that portion there was vomit. So it worked out fine. <laughs> and so to this very day, when you see that scene, you can know that while the scene was being shot, people, everybody was vomiting. Oh my God. Yeah. And when I was doing the make-believe, like, oh yeah, oh baby, oh yeah, that was, that was all fake. Interesting, huh? Yeah. The magic of movie making. Yes. There's always stories like that in every industry, right? Do you, do you ever wish that you had chosen a different career? Or I guess we all do that sometimes, because like, I was going for a mainstream career. I didn't choose porn. You know, yeah. I wanted to do... I wanted to that came up in Boston, right? I, good for you. Yeah, yeah. It was um, Joe Sarno, and he, again, a very well-known filmmaker of, like, B quality. But it was good. People liked his stuff. And that's where it all began, you know? Him and a guy named Dylan Ross brought me uh, onto various sets to see how it goes. I said, Ron, what do you say? And there you have it. I said, I'll give it a try. I, th I think your, your, your personality trait, where you don't take things seriously, you look at everything with a little... Grain of salt. Yeah, I think that helps. But you want to be good and put on a good show. I mean, 
You really, you really want to and have to. You know, you, you, people think, oh, it's just porn. Just porn my ass, it's selling. You remember, I was there during the heyday, they called it the golden years. People, there, were th there were thousands of tapes, DVs, VHSs, internet, all coming, uh, coming along, being born. You gotta take it seriously. If you're gonna, you wanna become a porn star, you can't just hope. You take it like any other acting job. Get up on time, if it's a girl, have your hair in curlers. Go to the set on time. I mean, a porn film back in the 70s and 80s, it was just like a regular movie. That was a low budget. It was like a trauma film. Or it was like uh, Trey Parker, Matt Stone, like a South Park project. They don't believe in unions, or now they do. But they were doing low budget B movies with a real funny twist that it was hysterically funny. I worked for them. I was uh, one of the leads in Orgasmo. I also had the lead, a lead in, uh, well, a major part in Boondock Saints. Huge film. With Willem Dafoe plays an FBI agent who's gay and solves crimes. You know, so I've done about a hundred and some odd uh, uh, regular movies. Yeah, you've done quite a bit of mainstream work. What? You've done quite a bit of mainstream work. Mainstream work. Oh, yeah. I, did a, I have the world's record. Most music videos. Nobody's even close. Matt LeBlanc did 11. I did 56 music videos. The, the, what were the best years of your life? What was the best time of your life? Uh, I'd say when I was uh, making really great accomplishments. I wrote a book that was a New York Times bestseller. I did a rap song, and I can't rap worth a shit. But I did good with it, and it was called Freak of the Week. With DJ Polo, Ice-T, Sir Mix-a-Lot, Grandpa Munster, Lynn Redgrave, had a lot of stars in it. What was, what was your family's reaction when you became a huge porn star? They were hoping that I'd go on to better stuff. I told them it's only a means to an end, you know. So I said, oh, it's a means to an end. But you turned it into a, you, you probably made a lot of money. It's, it, You've probably made a lot of money. I didn't make a ton because they think that we're, we're millionaires. We're not. We're thousandaires. You know, the girls will make a couple of grand. I'll make a couple of grand once in a while. Otherwise, it'll be maybe a few hundred if it's a gang scene or a bunch of guys, one girl, a bunch of girls, one guy. Depends on the scene. You know, but it's not what people think. I mean, I looked at the internet. I saw the figures they gave me and Jessica Jane, the late great. Uh, Christy Canyon was in there. I saw what they were writing. They're way off base. They're saying all these people are millionaires. No, they're not. Not even close. So you don't really get always, always get the, the, tr the true uh, answer, you know, in some of the stuff. Yeah. yeah, we don't make what people think we do. And where does your career go from here? How, how old are you now? Oh, you bastard. Sorry, I don't want to ask. I want to ask. Oh, come on. I'm 66. 66. But you still look great. What? You're still, you still look great and you're still working. Oh, well, thank you for that. And I am slow doing scenes. I didn't, I didn't stop. Some people thought I stopped. No, I still work. Yeah. Too much fun to quit. How many films have you done? I have the world's record of porn, too, about 3,500. 3, wow. What are you most proud of in your life? That um, I did a rap song uh, called Sexy and I Know It. I was in it. Oh, you see me in three spots. And it went on to become... 150 million hits, a quarter or half a billion hits on Sexy End, I know it. I, I, had, I had about a thousand, no, about a half a billion people saw me saying goodnight, actually. It was a old, old Lang Syne. It's funny. This is definitely my appreciate. I, this was on CNN on the Anderson Cooper show. Remember him? Yeah. So he, uh, he invited him and Grant, Kathy Griffin invited me on the show. So it's got to be 14 seconds. So I did a 40, 14 second salute, old Lang Syne, right on target. My friend Adam Rifkin shot it. And uh, I was seen by half a billion people on the HBO. And it, hopefully it's something like this, two seconds. Uh, Thank you. You ought to see me on piano. You ought to see me on violin. A lot of the big name rock stars have said that 
I'm as good as they are. Yeah, they're all good I play violin, harmonica, and piano. You have other careers as a comedian and musician as well. Then, uh, yeah, if you look at the um, Kid Rock song called Cowboy, Wanna Be a Cowboy, Baby. See who's on the piano in that song. Cowboy. Mm. Excellent. And I played with the Celtic band in Ireland. So, wow. yeah, I've done a lot, of, a lot of fun. I've done a lot of fun things. It's been great. Yeah, I, th I think your attitude <laughs> has kind of facilitated you just having fun while you're doing your career and all these side ventures. And sure. Your personality is just very easygoing. Uh, well, thank you. Light and charming. I think that's, that's paved the way for all the, the success and all the kind of... Yeah, thank you ease that you, you have going through life. In, in, in what could be a really troubling career. I think you know, some people don't, don't. Of course. Some people don't, don't survive and thrive like you have. Well, that's sad. Look, actresses and actors have problems all over Hollywood. They even used to say that Alan Alda is so nice and so friendly and has so few scandals, he couldn't find a dog mean enough to bite him. Because he was known for being the real sweet, Good guy. We never cheated on his wife. Alice Cooper never cheated on his wife. I mean, there's certain things. They say Howard Stern never cheated on his wife. Now, is that true or false? Who knows? But it's funny because, you know, point is was very accurate. Depends how you get into the business. I used to tell that to kids I was teaching about, you know, when you want to continue with a job or try a different one. You know, I used to say that, you know, if you come into a, g a business with a level head and you're professional, you're on time, I don't care if you're a dishwasher, I don't care if you're uh, uh, cleaning fire hydrants or a porn star, you know, if you keep your head level, you take yourself professionally, take it serious, you can have fun. In fact, you should. But if you can do that, then you will do well. Because you're just you know, you're allowing yourself not to be taken too seriously because of this particular career, but you'll have fun and you'll make money and you'll it's a career like anybody else. Yeah. All right, Ronald. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. You're well, you're nice questions. Very well designed. <laughs> thank you very much.